The media this week is abuzz with the sensational story of a very important trial involving a very notorious killer, Zokar Tsarnaev. But as with all high-profile trials, there are many sub-stories. One sub-story involves important details dating back to 1995. You may recall, back in 1995, the high-profile case of Susan Smith. Smith had originally claimed she was carjacked, that her car had been stolen from her, containing her two sons. Later, we were told Smith admitted to driving her vehicle to a nearby lake, where she allowed it to roll into the lake and sink, with her two sons still strapped into their car seats. It was Judy Clark, acting as Smith's co-counsel, that helped Smith avoid the death penalty. Although not the primary defense attorney, it was Judy Clark that gave opening remarks in the case. It was the Smith case that started Clark on a path that would lead her into this week's headlines. It should be noted that her involvement with the case was at the request of defense attorney David Brooke, a friend of Judy's from law school. The next year, in 1996, came the case of Theodore Kaczynski in the case of the Unabomber. Kaczynski's appointed defense attorney, Quinn Denver, filed a request for Clark to be appointed his co-counsel, and she was. Just before jury selection, Kaczynski moved to dismiss his lawyers, including Clark, but the motion was denied. Clark ultimately helped Kaczynski avoid the death penalty, and he was sentenced to life at the administrative maximum facility in Florence, Colorado. A few years later, in 1999, a man by the name of Buford O. Furrow Jr. was said to have walked into the lobby of a Jewish community center in the Granada Hills area of Los Angeles and opened fire with a submachine gun. Firing at children and adults alike, he discharged 70 rounds before fleeing the scene in his van. 20 minutes later, Furrow was said to have carjacked a woman's Toyota at gunpoint, leaving his van behind. A short while later, Furrow was said to have approached a postal worker and asked if he might mail something, to which he pulled a handgun he was concealing and fired nine shots into the postal worker, point blank. From there, Furrow took an $800 taxi ride from LA to Nevada before turning himself in to a local FBI office. He was quoted as saying, quote, you're looking for me, I killed the kids in Los Angeles, unquote. But he had not killed any kids. In fact, despite firing 70 rounds, he only wounded five people at the community center. All recovered from their wounds. Only the postal worker died as a result of many handgun rounds fired into him at close range. Clark was appointed to defend Buford Burroughs and made great efforts to convince the court that Burroughs had serious psychiatric problems. Burroughs maintained that he was not guilty. Only the statements given by detectives stood as evidence that he ever admitted to the crimes. For those old enough to remember the phrase, hanging Chad, they might also remember that the whole recount fiasco ended on January 21, 2001, with the inauguration of George W. Bush as president. A few days later, on January 24, not much was reported when Furrow changed his mind and pled guilty to 16 felony counts against him. At this point, Judy Clark had shown signs of being a very successful at helping her clients avoid the death penalty, despite some of those clients not asking for that help. She had certainly proven herself a team player, so it isn't too surprising that her next case would be her highest profile yet, the case of Zacharias Musawi, the 20th 9-11 hijacker. Early in the trial, Musawi filed a motion to represent himself, which could be taken to mean that he didn't wish to be represented by Clark. His motion was granted, and Clark served only as standby counsel. Despite Musawi representing himself, Clark continued to act as a consultant to the defense. Musawi eventually pled guilty and was sentenced to life also at the administrative maximum facility in Florence, Colorado. In 2004, Clark was appointed lead counsel in the case of Eric Rudolph, the accused Olympic Park bomber. Rudolph, too, pled guilty and avoided the death penalty in doing so. He was sentenced to life and was also sent to the administrative maximum facility in Florence, Colorado. Fast forward to 2011. This time in Phoenix, Arizona, the U.S. District Court assigned Clark as defense counsel to Jared Lee Loeffner, the accused Tucson, Arizona shooter said to have killed federal judge John Roll and severely wounded Congresswoman Gabriella Giffords. It doesn't appear that Clark raised the issue of a fabricated mugshot being released before the trial, 
so it's likely we'll never know for sure who was responsible. Needless to say, the responsible party wasn't doing any favors to Lofner. Which brings us to the present and the trial of Zokhar Tsarnaev, accused of participating in the Boston Marathon bombing. To say this case is a psyop is an understatement. First, the scene of the first supposed bomb itself is rife with scenes of fakery. Rather than go into those examples here, I'll simply defer the viewer to the YouTube accounts of PK22 and Plasma Burns, who have, among others, done exemplary work showing the minute evidence of the fraud. After the capture of Tsarnaev, during his first appearance in court, a former wrestling teammate and friend of Tsarnaev's had this to say about what he witnessed in the courtroom. Um, it was it was hard for me to believe that he was he was sitting down there. Uh, it wasn't the same guy. He was a changed person, I guess. Why did you? The way he looked, the way he kept moving his body, his posture, and all. The story of Tsarnaev's capture kept changing from moment to moment. First, he was reported to have shot himself in the throat. Next, the story changed to his being shot by law enforcement in the throat. But to really clinch the fact that all of this reporting of the throat wound was meant to confuse the viewer, just watch this clip of a SWAT unit commander describing the wounds and watch the expression or reaction of his team as he does so. Uh, so at that point we needed to get him away from the boat. Uh, as soon as he was checked uh, for anything, handcuffed, we just picked him up and ran like hell to get away from that boat. Uh, and got him over to where the, uh, the medics are and the federal agents who were taking him into custody. There's a report that he was shot in the, in the throat, uh, unclear whether that was self-inflicted, whether right. or at what point that, did I, you, could you tell that? I did see a throat injury. To me, it looked uh, more like a, a knife wound. Uh, it wasn't a puncture hole, it was a slice where, the, where it was spread open. For anyone as confused as I was, yes, their uniforms do read transit police. In Massachusetts, what was originally set up to patrol and enforce laws on the various public transportation systems was given extended authority over the years. They now have as much authority as any other local police force and even have SWAT teams and intelligence units. As a researcher of conspiracies that tend to involve very coordinated efforts by government agencies and law enforcement, I can say with certainty that the Tucson shooting and Boston bombing events were conspiracies perpetrated by the authorities. We can add the Musawi trial to the list as the 9-11 related Musawi trial would necessarily need to be a mix of misinformation and theater. So, what are the common threads between these cases that just happen to involve Judy Clark? For one, many appear to be the result of grand conspiracies, where the accused's actual involvement is unknown. Second, the defendants tend to at least eventually plead guilty. Thirdly, they appear to plead guilty to avoid the death penalty, with this result always being credited to Judy Clark. There's much more to the story, especially involving Clark's career in the 80s and 90s, but I'll leave it to the viewer to pursue that if interested. To summarize this report, there appears to be a secret agenda in each of these high-profile cases where Judy Clark's services is a critical element. What that secret agenda is, I can't say for sure. Suffice it to say that in the future, any time Judy Clark is involved in a case, I suggest looking for the PSYOP lurking beneath the show trial taking place.